Uh, thanks everyone for being here, uh, and uh, everyone in the live stream for uh, sort of half being here, uh, not geographically. Uh, so first, I'm going to introduce uh, introduce our panel. Hold, uh, please hold your applause uh, till I finish that, and then we'll um, uh, and then you applaud, and then uh, we'll we'll start we'll start getting into it. So uh, so first to my immediate left is uh, is Sharon Zukin. She's a, a late adopter sociologist who writes about cities and. Uh, uh, and hackathons and race and gentrification in Yelp reviews. Uh, she's known for teaching at the Brooklyn College and CUNY Graduate Center and uh, is the author of Naked City, The Death and Life of Authentic Urban Places and Loft Living. Next we have, uh, we have Ava Kaufman, who is, the, uh, is a Brooklyn-based writer and, uh, and the editor of The New Inquiry. And finally we have, we have Kyle Cheka, who's a, a writer living in Brooklyn, covering technology and aesthetics for publications, including The Verge, New York Times Magazine, and N Plus One. And uh, we also had Kate Loss here, who unfortunately um, uh, got stuck in weather uh, on, uh, and is delayed on an airplane. But we're going to have some quotes from her I'm going to throw in. So, so she's here in spirit. So uh, give a round of applause for our fam. So one one thing, uh, let's just start sort of uh, big picture here, right? Um, uh, and Kate, uh, she had this this great quote in something she recently wrote um, on her website where where she asks she poses the question, uh, "What do you recycle when it feels like the end of history?" Uh, and I think the other three keynote panels are gonna, you know, sketch out what the end of history is starting to look like. But uh, but that term end of history started much earlier in the 90s with like Francis Fukuyama and the idea of like, you know, you, we just toy around with liberal democracy and everything else will be fine. Um, and, and this seems like an interesting or a weird question to approach like design and urbanism and, and stuff like that. But I, th I think there, there is definitely uh, a lot uh, uh, that filters into our everyday lives through urbanism and through technology. So I was wondering if we could just pose to the, to the panel uh, what, um, what does that sort of end of history look like, and what are like the really big changes uh, in um, in the city happening right now in urbanism that uh, uh, that we should be looking at? To you, I'll um, I'll start us off. Um, people were talking about the end of cities in the United States in the 1960s when middle class people, a lot of white people, um, a lot of capital investment moved out into the suburbs and eventually, as we know, into other regions of the world. Uh, but the cities did not end then. And then some cities began a slow and lingering, uh, uh, gasping uh, agony, but others came out of it, uh, like New York and Los Angeles and uh, Boston. Uh, so th the end of history has been applied to cities, but it's a selective kind of application. Nonetheless, cities are in a real crisis today in the United States and around the world. First of, and I'll, now I'll talk about something for a second that I don't know anything about myself, and that is the environmental crisis. I mean, here we are uh, five years after Hurricane Sandy in New York City, and there's still a whole lot of building on the waterfront, uh, usually very expensive building on the waterfront, as well as um, media district and um, various digital, digital district in Brooklyn. And uh, nobody's seriously trying to plan or build for, uh, for the resiliency that they're talking about. So environmental disaster, that's you know, the end of history as I see, you know, immediately applied to mm -hmm. cities. And most cities of the world are built on rivers for you know, uh, uh, reasons of uh, transportation and steam power in previous centuries. So uh, you know, what we don't, maybe we don't need to be right here, but we are here and we have a lot of valuable land right here and a lot of people, so what are we gonna do? Um, the second kind of problem, of course, is an economic problem. Uh, there is such a mismatch between housing and income. Uh, if the future, if the end of history means the end of work as we have known it, 
and I suspect I might be the only person on this panel who has a full-time job, which does not reflect the qualities of my fellow panelists, but it might reflect my generation uh, and my entry point into the, uh, the labor force and the fact that I'm a public employee. Um, so uh, people can't afford to live in cities all around the world. That's a, you know, that's an end of the city population. If they don't have any jobs to do in cities, um, that's, you know, another end of history as we have known it. Now it's your turn. <laughs> and and, and I'll, I'll just say the panel, uh, we're opening up with this big question, then we'll get to, uh, you have some prepared stuff, we'll get to that in a second. Going in order? Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I don't, I don't know about the end of history, or if I can speak to that specifically. Um, but thinking about the kind of the biggest transformations in the city right now, um, I think all of us have written a little bit about how, how cities are being homogenized or, or turned into kind of anywheres or, or everywheres. Um, but I think one aspect that's been kind of missing from that or reporting, a lot of reporting has happened alongside that is this idea that cities are also um, de-anonymizing us um, through the encroachment of surveillance technologies that are um, at the same time as these apps are kind of breaking off smaller and smaller slices of our life and transforming them into capital and, and things that we do work for. Um, these surveillance technologies are also doing the same and making it increasingly hard for um, you know, anyone to have anywhere to hide. So I think that at the same time that these cities are becoming placeless, they're also becoming spaces where there's nowhere to hide. And I think thinking about those things alongside each other um, is really interesting and not something I've seen at least a lot of like media criticism or design writing about typically. Is this, yeah, it's working. Um, so I guess a lot of my recent work is focused on kind of superficial visual culture and, and aesthetics. Um, but when I hear the phrase, the end of history, or, or think about that, I kind of think about how a lot of our aesthetic trends are moving toward this kind of idealized empty box of light and space, uh, kind of part art gallery, part luxury condo. Um, and that, to me, is like the, the visual culture and the form and the aesthetic that's, that's also taking over cities, as you see, you know, an old warehouse or a new skinny skyscraper transformed into just a bunch of empty boxes that people don't even often live in at this point. They just kind of exist as investment vehicles. Uh, and I think, I think that's producing a, a kind of vapid, empty culture as well as like as the city fabric and the city culture turns into just like capital, I guess. So wh while we're down on that side, uh, Kyle, do you want to start with uh, with your presentation? Sure. We can work our way back. Uh, did I just open up the yeah, just Sorry, this is kind of grainy. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a journalist. Uh, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, I say that as kind of an excuse. Um, <laughs> uh, that is to say, like, I, a lot of my pieces kind of get at trends in a, in a more superficial way than, than critical theory. Um, but over the past year, I'm just kind of going to talk through what my work has been like over the past year. Uh, and it first kind of evolved when I started noticing this magazine everywhere I went on Earth. Um, <laughs> you know, you would walk into a design boutique in Brooklyn or like an Airbnb in Copenhagen or, you know, a bookstore in Beijing and on every shelf there would be an issue of Kinfolk magazine. Uh, and it just became this kind of symbol that I kept running into and didn't understand. I didn't know how it got there. I didn't know why people really liked it. It's not a good magazine. <laughs> it's not enjoyable to read. Uh, and yet you see this staring out at you everywhere. And it's, it, it was deeply unsettling. <laughs> uh, and so I, I undertook to write this article that uh, got at the founder of Kinfolk Magazine. Um, 
who is this guy, <laughs> Nathan Williams. Uh, and this is in Kinfolk's offices in Copenhagen, uh, a newly renovated space that is completely empty. Uh, and Nathan Williams, man of mystery, is a Mormon from rural Canada who has become this kind of like crypto lifestyle icon, even though no one knows who he is. He's not famous at all. Uh, he hates Instagram. And yet, like, his life and his work has given rise to this, like, kinfolk aesthetic that seems to be everywhere that the magazine is. Like, you don't just see the magazine. You see, like, a raw wood table and, like, some ceramic stuff and, like, you know, other fancy magazines that have followed in kinfolk's wake. Um, and so I went to go find him and meet him in Copenhagen just to see, like, what, how, did, how did this happen? Um, and what I found was that he was super oblivious. Like, he is not on Instagram. He's not really big into social media. He has just, like, refined this kind of idealized 21st century lifestyle that everyone seems to identify with. Um, and then, <laughs> so after... After Kinfolk, uh, you know, that piece came out. And I think what's, what's interesting about Kinfolk, too, is that, like, the Kinfolk has 80,000 subscribers or something. But the hashtag Kinfolk on Instagram has millions and millions of posts. And it's all people posting images of Kinfolk on raw wood tables or, like, marble countertops <laughs> as the symbol of their aspirational lifestyle, like, next to their cortados. Um, and so I did the kinfolk piece, and then I started thinking about coffee shops uh, and how every coffee shop in the world looks like this coffee shop, which is in Williamsburg. Um, and you have the same combination of like blank white walls, uh, exposed brick, wooden table, like minimalist iron furniture, small succulents on the tabletop. <laughs> Uh, you know, the big, the big wide windows that let in lots of natural light. And, you know, as I was thinking about these coffee shops, uh, this, is, this is another coffee shop in Copenhagen, uh, not far from the Kinfolk office. And what was funny, this is called Atelier September. Um, and if you ask, like, your hipster friends what you should do in Copenhagen, they will tell you to go to Atelier September and have the avocado toast. Uh, so, you know, I w it's like there's this collection of, of lifestyle symbols that exist in the world uh, that everyone c has kind of gathered around. Uh, and then, then I started thinking about Airbnb. Um, and this image is from a f uh, this artist named Laurel Schwulst's project, uh, Modern Life Space. Uh, and she would just crawl through in, through Airbnb and like collect images of, of apartments from different places. And they all kind of look the same. Like there's, th there's this vocabulary, an, an Airbnb vocabulary of like minimalist furniture and big windows and white. Um, and so as I was kind of like thinking about in, uh, Airbnb, uh, I kind of came up with this theory that this combination of stuff like Instagram and Airbnb and like you know other digital platforms and physical spaces like like WeWork and other things we're creating this kind of like generic geography uh, across the world that has this kind of aesthetic and anywhere you run into a Kinfolk magazine or like this particular combination of symbols you're within this world that I called airspace and it's kind of like identityless and frictionless if you're, you know, if you fit its uh, requirements. Um, and this is this is a WeWork office. Uh, and I was just struck by how this aesthetic has kind of spread everywhere, and yet it doesn't have a like geographic identity in any one place. Uh, so you could you could be in this space and be anywhere. Uh, you could be in Bangkok, you could be in New York, you could be in LA, you could be in, you know, wherever. Uh, this, so this is the Airbnb office in San Francisco. Uh, and I interviewed Airbnb's like chief architect uh, for this story about airspace and like the generic Airbnb aesthetic. 
And as I was talking to him, he made up this term that was international Airbnb style, uh, entirely unprompted from me, uh, which I loved because it's like partly it's like international style, the like modernist architectural movement, uh, but also like it's an ideology that Airbnb has at the deepest parts of its like corporate DNA. Uh, so they have this office which was designed by Gensler, I want to say. Um, but if you look at like in the back of this photo, there are all these little conference rooms. And each of the conference rooms is designed to look like a specific Airbnb from a different country. <laughs> and so they've like appropriated the aesthetics of these different places and then mushed them all into their corporate headquarters, like in a in a metaphorical way, like making all of these places into one place and, and building a network between them, which is what I think they've done uh, in a very powerful way. Um, but you can see also the same aesthetic invades their space. Like there might as well be a Kinfolk magazine on the coffee table there. Um, and then just like as I as I go forward with this work, I think more about the the idea of lifestyle and like what lifestyle symbols you aspire to. And Airbnb has continued along this vein of like telling you that you can live anywhere and belong anywhere uh, just by like staying in someone's house. So this ad is what, like, you become a graphic designer in Tokyo by staying in this artist loft. <laughs> like, by inhabiting this space, you suddenly become this super hip dude in, like, salvage denim and a blue shirt, you know, doodling your indie comics or whatever. Um, and it just, it, like, inspires within me this, like, deep sense of dread or doom that, like, <laughs> you know, every everything I aspire to, everything I think is cool or interesting or compelling within my life is just like possibly a product of these platforms that exist in the world now uh, that I travel through. And like, I look at this and I totally want to be there, you know? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say no. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the route that my work has taken, uh, this, this like generic frictionless, identityless place that, that looks like a minimalist condo mixed with a coffee shop. And we all live there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. and uh, w while Ava gets uh, set up real fast, I'll, I'll just um, uh, uh, I want to put a pin in the idea of an art gallery and luxury condo because I, that two th those two things together, I think, are probably uh, something we're gonna we're gonna come back to pretty pretty often. If I can add something yeah. to that in the in the interlude, um, maybe uh, Kyle's really terrific uh, uh, thought process uh, brings up the end of geography, not the end of history. I mean, in addition to the end of history, the the end of geography. But um, uh, I, I, if you physically were in Copenhagen to do the interview and you weren't doing it on Skype or something like that, then w we're, in a, we're, we're talking about the counterpart to these, these digital agents of, um, of homogenization. We're talking about globally mobile consumers and producers of these things. So I think we, you know, we have to, to bring together in one framework the globally mobile people as well as the global agents, cu cultural agents. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can I say something quick? <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of, part of my working process with that is like there is this hypermobile group of creative people who inhabit these spaces. And as you know, you work on your designs in the, on your laptop in the coffee shop or whatever, or you go to Tokyo for a gig and you're staying in someone else's Airbnb. Like as this kind of homogenous community circulates through different places, I think they wear down the identity of those places, and as they want to consume the same things in every place, no matter what. Yeah, I mean that's a really helpful segue because I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how this generic geography, how how we're working for it, and and who it's actually doing doing work for, and the kind of um, labor questions there. Um, and my slides are a little more Google Images than Kinfolk, so <laughs> might be an eyesore. But I guess I first started thinking about kind of the smart city and also this idea of the smart home 
um, through thinking about the blockbuster game SimCity. Um, and SimCity was, a lot of you know, urban designers and planners and engineers have actually explicitly said that SimCity was the inspiration um, for you know, what made them want to be an architect or an engineer. And uh, when I was first looking at that and when I first heard that, I kind of imagined the smart city, um, in retrospect, kind of naively, as the city that we would build from scratch. Like we would build it from the ground up and it would have all of these new sensors and tools and technologies. And um, just like in the game SimCity, it would maximize efficiency and that would be the goal. And um, obviously the dystopic version of that is that you maximize efficiency and that's at the cost of you know, social repression. Um, you know, maybe the, the trains run faster, um, but there's other human freedoms uh, that are at stake. But I think what's actually emerged in the smart city is something that's a lot more pernicious and insidious and not explicitly repressive, but actually um, fairly coercive. And I think that the smart city is already here and it's in something um, like Uber, which uh, I think more than any city is actually wha where um, we see SimCity's legacy. Uber's been really inspired by SimCity so much that it's uh, you know, using psychological tricks to gamify its rides um, and inspire its drivers and um, get us on their grid. I mean, we're signing up to be part of this, this smart city. And so I think part of the reason we don't realize you know, it's already here is because it's not built from scratch, it's being retrofitted to fit our existing environments. And one of the terms that people have kind of used to explain this process is um, this idea of the Internet of Things. And um, it's kind of just a fancy way of saying that our smartphones and uh, the thermostats we have in our houses and ideally our toothbrushes and our beds and our fridges are all going to be hooked up to the Internet. And they're going to scrape all of this data from our lives that to us is maybe individually really meaningless. I mean who cares how many times I open the fridge or how long I brush my teeth for, but as an entire demographic, when a company takes all of this data, it's actually incredibly meaningful. Um, and you can imagine a smart toothbrush um, that you get for free, and it's really cool because it counts how long you brush your teeth, but if you skip a night, it sends that, that um, information to your insurer and your premiums raised. Um, and that's like, it sounds kind of you know, like an exaggeration, but we're already seeing Facebook data being scraped and sold to uh, auto insurers uh, depending on how many exclamation points someone uses in a post. That means they're a riskier driver. So um, this idea, I mean, Rem Koolhaas, an architect who you probably know a little more about, um, his, his idea is that the smart home is gonna betray you by you know, taking all of this data um, and kind of feeding it back into you, um, into, into these companies. Um, in a really dangerous way. And I think the parallel here um, that I like to think about is a lot of people used to say that kind of like second life um, was going to be like virtual reality. Like we're all gonna log into this kind of top-down centralized system that someone's designed and those avatars are really gonna take over. And what actually happened is that it was Facebook. And I think we're seeing a similar thing with you know the smart city. It's, it's actually the internet of things. It's not um, a government. And Singapore is an outlier. It's an exception to the rule. Um, you know, New York City is also already the smart city. Um, and we're already all kind of working for it in different ways. And I think that the kind of craziest part about this, and I know we'll go a little more into co-living, um, but the thing that I just kind of wanted to touch on is it's easier for us to understand, okay, you know, these, these apps are quantifying our data or, you know, taking bits of information from us. But what co-living is doing, and co-living is just um, Silicon Valley's rebranding of the idea of living with roommates. So they're selling you the idea of living with roommates. Um, and it's companies like WeWork, it's co-working companies. You can now live with your work friends. Um, there's, they're also not just selling you the idea of living with roommates, they're selling you back the idea of community. So something that you would have already done, live, make friends, <laughs> make breakfast, have a potluck, have a boyfriend, go to yoga, that's something that they're actually charging more in the rent. It's a built-in community. You get to facilitate the convening of distinct people and their passions. <laughs> and what's crazy about that is not just that they're selling that, but it's actually that if you're um, making friends in your co-living space or if you're hosting a dinner, you're creating value for this company because then you go on their Instagram and they're selling that back to you as part of their brand. 
Um, so it's not just co-living and, work and co-working are you know, being blended together because both are the same 24-7. It's that um, all of these basic functions that you know, we previously uh, didn't even understand could be commodified um, are now becoming so. And this is great. This is a co-working basement and a co-living space. And this is an Internet of Things device in a co-living space. Um, and yeah, so I guess just to close, I think that SimCity um, is really fascinating, not just because of the top-down vision, but because in 2013 they added people for the first time. And they actually, um, they've seen it all, they kind of predicted everything, because the people they added aren't characters, they're these nameless, faceless workers that are dispatched by an algorithm to go work in an industrialized zone in the game that needs more workers and that fits within their class bracket. So the whole city's class divided, so they can only work, you know, certain people can work in a factory, other people can work as doctors, and the algorithm then decides where they go and sleep at night, and they can sleep in any home that has a slot for them or a space. So when you think about it, this really is the future of the co-living, like co-working environment. I mean, um, and that's why I kind of have the Uber app in the corner. And then one other crazy, crazy detail about that is uh, the manual calls the sim agents selfless little troopers. And it mentions that if their home gets destroyed, um, they want to maximize efficiency, so they'll just go to another home. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess maybe that's a better answer to the future of the city. But it looks like that. Thank you, selfless trooper number two. Yeah. Uh, while while, um, while Sharon's getting set up, I, I, one, I think one thing that's, that, that's worth paying attention to is how um, under, wh when, you, when you bring up issue, like ideas of like post-capitalism or uh, something other than capitalism uh, or economic arrangements, you get, um, you know, like like uh, uh, like the government's gonna steal your toothbrush, right? Or like if, if there's no property, then you know, then your 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 toothbrush goes away. But here, uh, uh, neoliberalism wants to uh, rent your toothbrush to you, and so like there, so it's actually it, neoliberal capitalism's taking your toothbrush, not communism, uh, and you and instead you just rent it out, and it and it raises your insurance premiums. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I uh, uh, deeply appreciate uh, Kyle's and Ava's work, and I'm so glad to be able to, uh, to join you today. So I'm a sociologist, and these are the kinds of things that, uh, and these are the kinds of things that I've been writing about for a long time. Um, a number of years ago, I wrote a book about New York City. Uh, David mentioned it, Loft Living. And I thought, well, this is just a light little book, and you know, I'm never going to come back to this. And it turned out that that set me on the, um, the evil path of reviewing every 10 years what was happening in New York City, starting in the really um, epochal uh, change era of the 1970s and just you know, looking at um, what has been happening to, uh, to make things both better and worse since then. And most of my stuff comes out to this conclusion. Um, <laughs> uh, so much for objective sociology. <laughs> and um, just to explain a little bit on a slightly different scale from Ava's or Kyle's, so I started looking at how the real estate market in living lofts began. And I didn't see this as a question of any particular neighborhood like Soho or Tribeca or um, certainly not Williamsburg when I started doing this, this research. Um, and I, I had to come to grips with uh, what I called uh, the artistic mode of production. And Richard Florida became much more famous and much richer calling that the creative class. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we had the situation where the whole manufacturing ecosystem of cities 
was destroyed beginning in the 1960s, uh, initially by movement to low-wage areas in the metropolitan region, and then by low-wage areas in the United States, and then by low-wage areas overseas. Um, and artists came in to take up the slack, probably because of the numerical increase in artists and uh, college graduates it, with the expansion of public as well as private higher education in the 1960s. But these people didn't have that much money and they were willing to live in the kinds of spaces that genuine low-income people uh, with much less education were not willing to consider residences. That is these you know, old uh, decrepit industrial lofts. So here we have the founders of the restaurant that became really famous uh, it, as, as a hallmark of early Soho, a restaurant called Food, uh, taking down the, um, the uh, signs of the restaurant that they replaced. And I think it's particularly interesting that they replaced a Latino restaurant uh, owned by Dolores, I think it says, um, so that we, we never think that artists displaced people, but in fact they were part of the, the shock troops of gentrification, as uh, some other people have, have called them, uh, who displaced the manufacturers and their, uh, their workers who were there before them. And of course we know what has happened to Soho since then. Food no longer exists and uh, some of the initial luxury goods uh, stores of the 1990s no longer exist in Soho. But we, you know, we, this is the kind of thing that I've been uh, obsessed by and documenting since, since the 1980s. So most recently, as David mentioned, I, I, wrote, a book called, uh, I wrote a book called Naked City, and uh, I've been concerned with uh, what, has, uh, what vernacular landscapes have replaced the old vernacular landscapes and the people in the old vernacular landscapes. I mean, you know, in, in the same neighborhood, this happens to be Crown Heights, not represented in the book, but th these are more recent photographs. Um, you know, we have the vernacular landscape of the, uh, the food hall, uh, descended from Chelsea Market of the, of the 1990s and now reproduced in many similar real estate developments around this city and other cities. Uh, but they're replacing and displacing the, um, the low-priced shops where uh, longtime residents have, um, have, have uh, consumed their, uh, their foods. I think it's interesting that as you, as you look at the march of real estate development, AKA gentrification, you see the disappearance of the we accept uh, EBT signs that you still see on this fish store in Crown Heights. So my most recent book, uh, written with about 12 research partners in um, New York and five other global cities around the world, is about local shopping streets and how they uh, embody globalization and, um, and cultural changes. So here's a street in a working class area or a former working class, now gentrifying area of East Amsterdam where you have side by side two hair salons. Uh, the one on the left is the hair salon owned by and for um, uh, mostly Muslim uh, migrants and that uses the traditional Dutch word for hair salon. But right next to it, we see the hair stylists using a different language, a different aesthetic, thanks Kyle, and uh, catering to a different group in the population, college graduates and creatives who have not only been moving into that area because of market forces, but they've been actively recruited by the city government, which has labeled this immigrant area a problematic district and has um, made certain rules and regulations that have displaced a lot of the immigrant store owners and uh, re uh, rental tenants. So that leads me to the same kind of point that Kyle and Ava get to. Uh, these are two other cities where my research partners and I have done research. Are we making all cities the same? Is it real estate development? Is it globally mobile consumers? Is it um, uh, the, uh, the, the digital platforms that convey the aesthetic? And what can we do about it? So that's the kind of stuff that I write about.
Uh, thank you. So one one thing that I, I think we can we could probably all start um, focusing in on a, as a group is, is uh, trying to be uh, is that is that cooperating? I just quit. Uh, command F. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what? A, uh, yeah. There you go. Uh, can we can we like zero in on what the um, what the capital flows are that are sort of pushing this this homogenization, right? So we have um, we have sort of corporate co living uh, roommates, right? And, and and but we also have these um, these more international trends of of, of trying to both uh, be sort of like be uh, um, uh, 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 familiar while also being a little bit of its place, right? What are, is this um, explicitly corporate, or could this be some other? Did it have to be corporate? Is basically what I'm asking for for these sorts of uh, homogenizing trends. So you you want us to zero in on capital flows, and you're posing a, a question of scale and scope. Is it corporate or is it individual? Yeah. Uh, and is it um, big or small? <laughs> yeah. Well, is it, well, because it's not only ne not all these processes aren't only nesting, but they also feed into each other in these really intricate ways, right? Okay. So what? So what? Uh, we just gotta like figure out where where those are going, how it's flowing, what. Okay, it, let, let, oh. let me start. Start. Yeah. Try to start us off. So um, when people talk about gentrification, they talk about state-led or market-led gentrification. And often there's a combination of state and market because governments, uh, not least city governments, have a whole global toolkit of practices and strategies that they learn from their own uh, meetings around the world where they talk about how to attract more investors and more um, more visitors, more tourists to their city. Uh, so there are those policy changes in addition to uh, uh, capital seeking a happy home uh, for itself and individuals, rich individuals, let's say, who are buying uh, uh, residences all over the world, forcing the merely rich local people to scale down their aspirations and look at other neighborhoods for their palatial homes, which forces the mere middle class to look in other neighborhoods, and then you know that leaves the rest of us scurrying around trying to find niches in the housing market. So there's a um, you know a multi-dimensional uh, set of um, uh, actors and uh, and and motivations that. Is uh, is or are pushing uh, capital all over into whatever uh, whatever cities seem to provide safe havens, and the, the you know and but this is felt in different ways, again depending on uh, local laws that may protect or in New York City's case not protect rental tenants. Yeah, on the on the kind of the top-down smart city side that I said was an outlier. There are these huge um, initiatives to make economic free trade zones in you know places where there was maybe nothing, or like reclaim land from the sea and build a city that's by an airport in order to have some sort of economic hub or zone. So one interesting example is in South Korea. There's a city called Songdo that was kind of built from the ground up and it's built on a protocol that it wants to export to other cities that it, they can also download. So it's this kind of like city operating system. And those are obviously major capital investments that are being funded um, by a combination of governments and private investors. But I think that on the co-living side, what's really interesting is that um, the co-working and co-living companies, they themselves are trying to model these patterns of flexibility. So WeWork doesn't even own its buildings, it leases them because it's trying to have an asset light approach is what it calls them. So, um, and I think that co-living, you can look at it in some ways as a solution to a problem that Silicon Valley created like in cities, um, not in Silicon Valley only, but you know, everywhere, which is to say that like 
these are, are living situations in which they don't want you to sign a lease. They don't want you to settle down. Um, it's, it's housing not just for like the tech class, but for precarious, I mean, not for precarious workers because the housing is still somewhat expensive, but they're trying to get into a price point where it actually is um, housing for someone who moves to a city with no contacts and who can live anywhere and work anywhere and just have their card and maybe they swipe in at you know Common and Crown Heights one night and the other night maybe they're uptown working a different temporary gig and they swipe in there. Um, and so it, it's not quite housing for, for Uber drivers, but it is housing for the kind of freelance economy. Um. Yeah, there's a... Um uh, uh, there's a, an interesting parallel there with like um, the, the like the new towns that that were that were popular in like the this the, the or, or were they were trying to build them in, in decades past where you know you uh, y if if you think that the city is blighted and impossible to 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 save you build these new sort of suburban towns on the fringes these were popular in around London right and the, and the, and those were specific kind of connection to capital because they were they were built for cars and they had as the form of them were meant to uh, to connect to very specific you know you weren't taking that uh, your car from the new town to a factory right you were taking it to some sort of uh, bureaucratic paper pushing job so I, I I think that's that's it's fascinating that now there there is like sort of this new shift where uh, you, you create life as a service, basically, <laughs> and, and, and that, that frees you up and sort of like, uh, we'll get real Marxist here, right? It gives you that double freedom, right? Of, the, you know, you, of not only place, but also culture. So you're, or because you can, you can buy the culture too, right? So you, you can do both, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe speaking to a slightly more consumer, like individual consumer level, I feel like a lot of this stuff speaks to how we consume brands rather than products. Like the companies encourage us to identify more with WeWork or more with Airbnb or more with Common, which is another co-living space, than identify with like a neighborhood or something else. So we're, we're kind of consuming these branded spaces and infrastructure rather than like building our own organic ones. And I think there's like, similarly to like how cities have become desirable, like the brand of a city is desirable and then the brand of WeWork is desirable to certain people and the brand of Airbnb style mobility is desirable to certain people. So I think just even just participation in these systems has become aspirational to people and that's part of the reason why individuals choose to consume uh, what, what they offer. But you know, this, uh, to go back to David's uh, question, uh, this is so recent. I mean, it's within my lifetime anyway, maybe not in everybody's lifetime. Here in the 1980s, uh, brands which had existed since the 1880s in the United States in the form of um, gold medal flour and uh, Smith Brothers cough drops, which I, I, they don't exist anymore, but they had a, had a, a package uh, with the two Smith the two bearded Smith brothers on it, and uh, they represented a, a a late 19th century brand. You know, brands existed, but in the 1980s there was a concerted push to uh, to organize uh, the whole production chain from manufacturing down through retail sales uh, around the image of brands. And uh, it kind of started with the gap in, in a counterculture way in the 1960s, but uh, the 1980s uh, expanded that kind of uh, uh, whole brand selling to the Disney company. And then eventually we had uh, a, a whole universe of branded stores and generations, like a couple of generations of, of, of consumers that no longer knew you did not have to consume by brands. So this is, you know, branding has been so inculcated into the human consciousness that we can't even conceive of a world where we we where there aren't there aren't brands, but there are companies. <laughs> uh, and I wonder, can we go back, or can we move to some other uh, some other uh, knowledge that? demolishes the power of these companies. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I think 
um, <laughs> sorry, I totally blanked out. Um, I yeah, I hope that I mean just as the the like corporate digital platforms exist already, and we kind of live through those, that possibly by organizing ourselves independently on on more open source or more decentralized digital platforms, we can then use the same tools to create a more authentic, you know, lifestyle that, that maybe it does not exist under, under a brand's logo. Um. I, w I wanted to pose, see, let's see if, if anyone ha buys this. Um, uh, if, uh, um, uh, let's, uh, let's say that you know, like, um, we could, we, call, we could call like so safely call like Soho a brand, right? Or Dumbo, like, like a, uh, um, like neighborhoods as as a as a brand, and they have a very specific aesthetic attached to them that uh, that sort of like the Airbnb, sort of like Airbnb. Like because I live here, I now invoke and and are this quirky creative type, which is really all, all the way back to like the loft living was a, an ability to have like this posh apartment that you could also put art in, right? It, was, it had that that sort of space. So it was a luxury condo. It was literally a luxury condo art gallery. And so I, 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 I wonder if um, it, what I'm getting at here is like, are, are we seeing a, this is what I want to see if you, if you buy or not, if, if that, that um, place-based branding is getting finer. And, like, and so now you can, you can have that brand, in a, in a, it goes all the way down to a room or even a table. Well, you know, I, I'm sorry to jump in like this, yeah. uh, but you, you, you see what Kyle described at Airbnb with those city-themed rooms um, in a lot of tech spaces where they have the glass-walled conference rooms that are named for famous scientists or, and I've seen that around the world too, or uh, conference rooms that are named for neighborhoods of New York City, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I mean, there, there are c conscious uh, uh, branding um, uh, strategies that people use, companies use. I don't think neighborhoods have the the organization to uh, to to use those strategies, but some people are branding neighborhoods and and uh, making a profit from that. So this is um, you know this is all uh, all around us. In, in a way, people are grasping the local, and others are trying to make a profit from that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, this is very obvious, but just people, you know, taking pictures of, of Dumbo, you know, parts of Dumbo on social media and posting them, they're doing the work of the branding mm -hmm. um, for the space. And someone just had to come up with, like, a name like Dumbo, and then, <laughs> you know, which I don't. Um. Well, you know, the, the naming, I'm, I'm sorry, the, na the naming process is, is funny. Like, nobody really remembers and nobody knows exactly who came up with Soho, for example. Right. Dumbo, I'm not sure. I think uh, the, um, I, I've read that uh, artists who were already living in or near Dumbo before there was a Dumbo came up with the name because mm -hmm. they thought it was such an awkward name, it would never fly. But, you know, it took... Like Dumbo. <laughs> right. It took 20, it took, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you for voicing my unconscious. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, it took 20 years for the space that Two Trees Management Company owns in Dumbo to become really marketable. Uh, it wasn't automatic and, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't the name that propelled Dumbo to, to be so marketable. The same thing with Soho, it took, you know, maybe 20 years for these uh, few artists' collectives or individual artist lofts to become the the entity that was marketed as Soho. So it it it, it you know it takes a long time. That area that that we now know as Dumbo was formerly known as Fulton Ferry from the time Robert Fulton, you know, or some, uh, Fulton Street, sorry, not Robert Fulton and the steamboat, but, you know, from the time there was a, a, a ferry in the late 19th century uh, carrying uh, residents of Brooklyn Heights to offices in Wall Street. So, you know, neighborhood names uh, all uh, either commemorate some historic figure or some um, imagined historic figure, and they're often used to market the land or the buildings. 
I feel like uh, the brands of neighborhoods now are also getting appropriated and used to brand places that are not that neighborhood. Like, uh, there's this great story on the morning news, I think, and it's a list of every neighborhood of every major city that is the Brooklyn of that city. (laughs) And so you have this, like, exportable brand of Brooklyn that can then be applied to different places and used to kind of identify and define and like delineate what they are and what they should be. Uh, And, you know, once you brand a neighborhood as the Brooklyn of, you know, Seoul or something, then that branding is going to draw more of the same Brooklyn people to that place. Like another example that comes to mind with that is Soho House, which like uses a neighborhood name in London to then brand like a post-national series of like co-working, co-living, luxury club spaces in Istanbul and New York and Shanghai and everywhere. And Soho House kind of appropriates this like upscale London identity from from where it started and then just applies it wherever it goes. And I think that that its connection with London itself becomes more and more tenuous, just like the idea of Brooklyn has less and less of a connection to literally being in Brooklyn. People do that in business, too. Uh, when um, startup founders pitch an idea, they say, it's the Uber of X, right? That's been ridiculed already. So it's not just neighborhoods. I mean, we're, we're particularly sensitive that because to that because we live here. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about the way you put it, saying it's even finer, the process of branding. And it seems like, I mean, I guess there's the lifestyle element of it, but thinking about the way in which these brands are entering our home or private spaces, um, it seems like there's a lot of questions there about the way in which these these private spaces that are increasingly less private because maybe we're not even renting them or maybe we're on like a four-day lease or maybe it's someone else's home being rented to someone else being rented to us, but that they're also being uh, made less private through all of these uh, technologies and the Internet of Things and all of these brands in our home that are kind of... Um, blurring boundaries that we once thought are there, because if our our home is kind of hooked up or or on the grid, um, it's now uh, a data point among all of these other homes, and it's being circulated and used and entered into this flow um, in ways that we won't, we we can anticipate some, and we won't even be able to anticipate others. And I guess the other point about branding that I think um, is interesting is you've written uh, about some some of this, but the way that local governments and you know, what we conceive of as, um, you know, municipalities or, or not corporations are branding themselves more and more like companies. And we're seeing that with police departments as well, getting on social media and trying to have a voice. And um, it's kind of legible when we think about, you know, who these lifestyle brands are addressing. You know, they're addressing consumers. We can kind of grasp that. But I'm really curious, like, what what's going on when a police department is being, you know, friendly on Twitter or, like, who who that address is for, or how that how that's working, or how becoming a brand is useful there? Um, yeah, because you can say who is the you can you can then decide who is the consumer of that brand by d- saying who you're talking to, and by that way you're saying like who belongs here, right? Is it if if the if the police is wielding the brand of your city in a way that only speaks to a specific subset of people, white people, then like you know th- then all of a sudden. You're, you're, you very quickly have said who, who belongs here and who's not. I would also point out that um, slightly different is probably the finest grain of, of how you can consume a place is when like Brooklyn becomes a flavor, right? Like I, like I, I can go to a grocery, I live in upstate New York, I can go to a grocery store and get at least five things that uh, have Brooklyn written on them, right? There's like pickles, I think there's like a mayonnaise, and like, you know, right, there's like a couple different things that I, get, that I can literally consume, right? Obliterate it and make it a part, literal part of myself. Uh, and I, I, I think that that's like that. That's probably like that. Maybe the the end point there is that you can you can take these things that are um, ostensibly like not about a place, unless it, you know maybe like the food is grown there or something like that, or like you know chili, uh, Philly cheesesteaks or something like that, right? But um, but you can you can uh, as the social scientist Jeff Goldblum said you know put it on lunchbox and you're selling it and you're selling it and you're selling it right you can just throw it, you can throw it anywhere yeah, um, I, I I think one thing I I, I want to make sure we get to before we get to to audience questions is um is now going back to well how not necessarily what do we do about this but 
what are some some things that can can be brought to bear that mitigate some of the the worst effects of this, right? So uh, whether that's so if we're privatizing uh, culture that can um, uh, provide value in in an economy like like the one that we we find ourselves in, what what are the ways of taking stuff either out of private uh, um, corporate hands and put it in private, like smaller groups of people, or or socializing the value of of of, uh, of of all of all of these sorts of things. Well, I think your work can speak to this more, but I mean, I think one one thing we can do is anytime we're talking about something like co-living, point to the forms of co-living that already exist. Um, so we already have cooperative housing units in New York, and you know when we're writing articles about these things that are new, like going out of our way to point out in which they're just dressing up old forms of things and, and jacking up the prices. And we've also had single resident occupancy units in New York which have, um, have had a kind of checkered history but could be reclaimed as a form uh, where singles need to live. Because when, I mean, co-living proponents and boosters aren't wrong in seeing that there is a, there is a huge problem. There, you know, singles don't have places, singles, that's their word. <laughs> people living alone um, <laughs> don't have places to live in New York and that there's a huge demand. Like, they're right, but we can then do the work of pointing to other solutions and, and solutions that exist um, through zoning and through the city. I, I, I th think that Ava uh, has written about and spoken about something very important, uh, co-living arrangements. You know, uh, there are co-living uh, uh, forms in Sweden, for example, and in parts of the United States, where people share uh, the kitchens, they share responsibilities for cooking, they um, they have uh, living units of various sizes or apartments of various sizes in one building together with other people, and they are a social community without all the garbage PR about community. Um, but the basic point of those arrangements is that they're not made for profit. Housing is not an expensive commodity under those arrangements. And I think that's important to keep reminding people that co-living is not just this glorified college dorm for post-college people but it can be a, a pretty radical form of life. And there are co-op, uh, as, as you said, there are historic co-op apartment complex in New York City, but a lot of them have uh, got to the end of their legal term and they're being sold off as individual apartments at usually at market prices. So you know, how do we attack that kind of commodification and keep reminding people that co-living used to mean not paying an arm and a leg for housing. Yeah, I guess uh, I want to get out the question in a slightly different way where it's like, uh, well, I don't know if it's actually different, but um, I think we can also think more about what looks fashionable or cool to us. Like I think there's a sexiness to co-living and co co-working that like masks the actual realities of, of these things and the possibilities of us organizing those same things on our own in like an uncapitalized way. And then I think on an aesthetic level, like uh, with the kind of stuff that I talked about, maybe we can just be more aware of what shapes the spaces and things that we think are cool or compelling to consume. Like having, after having thought about this stuff for what's probably a silly amount of time, um, you know, when I go to a coffee shop that looks like the ones that were up there, or when I, you know, think about how I want to Instagram my Cortado or something, I, I think again, <laughs> you know, it, it kind of has introduced a skepticism to my appreciation of those things and a, much more thought about how I can create things that people want to consume that have a more tangible relationship to uh, our communities or our identities that don't just that aren't just imposed on us from lifestyle magazines or Instagram or or Airbnb these like corporatized capitalized networks. 
Yeah, no, I would. I would also throw in uh, as moderator prerogative, uh, like actually existing forms of uh, of, of cooper- uh, cooperative housing, like co-op city, right in in the Bronx, is is uh, uh, also one of the largest um, uh, centers of uh, equity owned by people of color, like that, like and that and that's probably not a coincidence, right? You know, so like I, I think that that's a um, and they're also and they're they're also fairly uh, they're uh, they're aging out of it, right? So like it, there's a, a a distinct possibility that that could be uh, privatized fairly quickly if if um, uh, if enough people like left left it, right? Um, and, and then there's also of course like land banks and stuff that that you've all talked about um, that are like really easy plug and play sort of like n- not not rocket surgery sort of opportunities to like figure out what yeah I said rocket surgery uh, like wh- like wh- what to uh, 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 like like wh- things that that aren't hard that have proved that they work and and uh, and, and and circulate wealth uh, fairly fairly well right. Uh, so I think we have. I think I think we're we're about there where we we can take some questions unless anyone wants to to add in anything there. No. Um, okay. Now this is a time where I play daytime talk show host and go into the audience with my microphone. Um, all right, uh, yeah. I guess I'll you first. Thank you. Um, first off, thank you for your presentation. My name is Mariella. Um, I wanted to just make a quick comment and then a question. My quick comment is that I'm an immigrant. And um, the reason why I mention that is because my experience in moving around to a lot of cities and living in a variety of different places, learning new languages, all that kind of stuff has been uh, relatively traumatizing, I would say. And in moving to new places and in finding familiarity with new places, um, I want to ask what parts of our life and what parts of our uniqueness you think we can look forward to maybe not um, throwing into a melting pot where things are going to continue to look the same everywhere in the world if other immigrants are going to experience this if future generations are going to experience this what parts of our uniqueness in our life in where we live the architecture the food that we consume the art that we look at the music that we listen to um, what parts of our life can we hope that will not look like that i guess i can if any (laughs) yeah um I mean, I, I worry about that issue of like everything looking the same and us losing so many things that we identify with, like our, our homes or our aesthetics or our food or whatever. Um, but I, I think if that condition is permanent or if it develops more going forward, then what, I, what comes to mind is like the actual networks of, of people that we move through and the, the ones that we create for ourselves. So those might not be based on a single place or a single, you know, environment or object of consumption, but there's still these like relationships that you have with with specific people, and it, it might be a nice thing that they transcend space and and um, you know phys- physical proximity. Well, I, I worry about this too. But, uh, I, I I think that um, migration is is such a such a strong experience today that uh, a a melding of cultures, more fusions, are inevitable. Um, If if we try to oppose that, we wind up sounding like the Trump administration. And um, I, 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 you know, I I just see more and more uh, people borrowing the cultures of, of, of other people, sometimes because they they uh, you know uh, willingly want to profit from it, or sometimes because they appreciate other things and the the fluidity of people uh, and and the fluidity of ideas can be good. Um, you know, protecting people's fluidity now, particularly if their legal status is not secure, is very important. Um, so I don't really know, and I don't know what you know uh, how how to make a a rule about what is the bad side of that and what is the good side. Other questions? Sure. 
No questions. This looks like one of my classes. <laughs> so um, a lot of discussion tonight has been kind of focused on a top-down view. For example, with Uber or branding or uh, homo homogenization. But I wonder if uh, you could address the, the, this whole issue from a bottom up. For example, um, Kyle mentioned about the uh, kinfolk, uh, that minimalist uh, aesthetic. What about that being potentially a reaction to the materialism that's so prevalent in society about uh, people's concern about the environment, that we're using too much of the resources? So that being a reaction to that. And for example, for Ava, instead of the uh, Uberization of city life, what about the um, communal living being a reaction to income inequality that's becoming a huge problem globally? People not having enough money or resources to have their own place. Or the idea that, that communal living reflects also the problem that is presented by the web or the internet of people becoming more and more isolated in their lives and not interacting and, and wanting to try to somehow escape that. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll go quick. Um, yeah, I think the minimalism aesthetic thing is is one phenomenon, and I do think that's a reaction to the excess of like stuff in our lives and and the amount of visual and you know linguistic information that's coming at us at all times. But I think I want to separate like the minimalist aesthetic from the structures that spread the aesthetic. Um, I think one way that I've thought about it in my work is that um, uh, like there isn't a Starbucks like corporation telling all of these coffee shops that they have to decorate the same way. There's no like mandated thing. But from the bottom up, like if consumers have a taste for that kind of aesthetic, and they're moving between cities all the time and, and recommending coffee shops that look like that on Yelp or Foursquare, then like that aesthetic is gradually going to become like the, the marketable aesthetic that will draw more people to your business. And that's kind of like a, a bottom-up reason that an aesthetic like that might, might evolve um, with the help of Yelp and Foursquare and Instagram. Hey, thanks for your question. I think you're absolutely right to say that, you know, communal living is arising from economic inequality and, you know, from society fracturing and from people also wanting to live together and from um, apartments for a lot of people, uh, apartments that, you know, house a lot of people being widely available. But I feel like it's, it's important to separate um, communal living, which we, I'm sure many of us already do, you know, living with roommates from co-living, which I feel like is, is the explicit effort of these companies to um, brand it and hype it and make it into something new, which is not to say that um, uh, co co their, their efforts at co-living have to be um, you know, negative in all their forms or because it's tech, it's bad. I'm just, I think, more interested in asking um, uh, kind of why are, they, why are they doing this and what are they getting out of it? And one thing they seem to be getting out of it is uh, making money off of the activities that we would already do with our roommates in close quarters. And also right now, um, making money by charging more and by having flexible leases in their buildings and um, by buying buildings that are sometimes, you know, previously occupied by people already living in those neighborhoods and pushing them out with, you know, flexible people um, who are moving in, who right now are, are a certain um, class and income bracket of people. So uh, let me try to add two, uh, uh, two different suggestions, uh, the, the old suggestion and the new suggestion. The old suggestion is to work in local communities, to press local government to provide public services that local government is supposed to provide. And as long as they don't do that by using a public-private partnership, or maybe even if they do use a public-private partnership, life to some degree may be better for people who, uh, who live in cities. The new suggestion is to keep innovating, to use whatever uh, knowledge we have to create microgrids and more urban agriculture, or at least regional agriculture, more alternative markets. The problem is that good ideas often are seized by uh, people, groups, or businesses that, um, that take them farther and capitalize on them, like you know, the flea market idea that was 
turned into smorgasbord and then exported to other places, I at least in the United States. Um, sharing, you know, sharing uh, is a good idea. Uh, how can it be done in ways that bring people together and can further their community, their solidarity, um, their autonomy without getting appropriated? Uh, let's do another one. All right, all right, yeah. Um, I want to piggyback off something David said at the beginning, where he was talking about the end of history. From what I've heard, you're talking about the end of cult, uh, community and society. Kyle, you're talking about the end of community in terms of the Ken folks sort of replacing a community aesthetic with a generic society, where you're talking about the co-workership, the co-living spaces as an elimination of societal impact. So if this is the end of community and society, is the grid the beginning of community and society? And if it's not, what is it? I went with Tony's argument, obviously, but like, how do we how do we start? How do we move on? With the, the the restarting point, or <laughs> um, you know, I I don't know. I mean, on a cultural level, to me, I'm I'm not co I'm not convinced that there is a way to get outside of the system that exists now. Like, if we have this massive grid right of facebook and instagram and and whatever that spreads culture like images and text and whatever if that exists and it occupies the entire world then like everyone is kind of be going to be experiencing the same things and even if something is cool or alternative or obscure it's instantly going to be absorbed by the mainstream and then it's all of a sudden the global mainstream generic um so i think culturally it's going to be difficult to both have a massive audience and exist outside of those networks. Uh, it, it's, become prof uh, it's become profitable even for individuals to take advantage of some of these digital platforms. Like, you know, I, I, trace, um, I trace a lot of what we've been talking about uh, to eBay back, you know, when, you know, in the 1990s where uh, people hived off parts of themselves, their possessions, and sold parts of themselves online. And then Airbnb comes along and people are hiving off parts of their living space and selling that. And, you know, people have, have a lot of people have, uh, for reasons of necessity or other reasons, have become very adept at using digital platforms to commodify themselves. So, you know, I, I, you know, I think more al at the danger of all of us on the stage sounding like Luddites and, um, uh, you know, horribly regressive, uh, uh, unimaginative souls, uh, I, you know, I, I think that more experimentation is necessary. You know, more people have to get together and try something. I feel like I'm actually not that pessimistic about the cultural side of things. Like I feel like when we're talking about an everywhere or any place turning into anywhere, I think that's that's true for particular groups of people or particular desires that people have. But even when we're thinking about this idea of Brooklyn, it's important to ask, well, who's Brooklyn? I mean, Brooklyn is is huge, and when we're talking about Brooklyn, we're still usually only talking about um, what like 30 or 40 percent of the borough that looks a certain way, and obviously that's expanding, but I don't think that these um, digital maps are like completely taking over the territory in the, in the sense of the, you know, Borgesian story, that, Air, that Airbnb, Airbnb is taking over parts of the world, but I don't think it's taking over all the world. I think where I get more worried, um, and I'll just touch on it briefly so that it's not a tangent, is on the kind of surveillance side of things and, and that grid and all of these technologies actually plugging in us into a kind of um, bigger system in that sense in which we kind of can maybe talk about everybody without overgeneralizing who that is. You know, through uh, uh, strategies of rationalization, we're all getting swept up into that. I mean, I see uh, that movement coming through big organizations um, even more than coming through uh, the, the household products that you talked about, although technically, yes, they, a lot of that comes through, through everyday objects. Um, like uh, even in the Obama administration, the digitalization 
of medical records was held out as a goal, you know, much m making healthcare more efficient and uh, making, uh, making it cheaper. But the digital digitalization of medical records often brings with it a strong probability of surveillance, and you, know, you alluded to that before. So at transportation, you know, of, um, you've written about this too, smart cities and big data uh, in, in principle make it possible to create more rational people moving transportation systems, but then maybe it'll, uh, it, 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 that kind of technology will also be responsible for cutting services to less frequented um, uh, networks, transportation networks. So um, it's not just surveillance, but uh, it's, uh, and not, not only in our households, but through many different webs, uh, tech, uh, digital technology makes it possible to move from the incredible growth of security guards as an occupation to the incredible growth of uh, CCTV. Yeah, I mean, I think part of like the end of idea is that so many different things are just becoming data, and then the data is filtered by algorithms. Like with with the surveillance technology that Ava has written about, I think you've covered face recognition stuff as well, right? Like, you know, the CCTV camera captures your face, and your entire being is reduced to a series of of data points and stored in a in a bank. Like that is you. And that that you is so much more easily filtered and and um, manipulated than your actual physical body in space. I love I love that you mentioned security guards, um, Sharon, because uh, some some surveillance critics I know have a kind of joke about the future of automation. And to them, they say, you know, the future of the city looks like an empty mall um, and a bunch of security guards guarding it. Like that, that's kind of going to be the last job on any. <laughs> Hopeful question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, let's let's go up here one for one one more. Um, right. So anecdotally, the naming of Soho was after an aristocratic British hunting cry, which they imported when they started hunting women in the Soho area of London, and then it got imported. Anecdotally, uh, question-wise. Um, when I walk into a queer flat in London and not a rich queer flat, it feels it has exactly the same aesthetic as walking into a not a rich queer flat in New York or, and I can only really compare these two, that's all I've been to recently. Um, when I walk into a falafel stand in or falafel shop in London, it feels it's got the same branding, it's got the same aesthetics. These are network effects, not necessarily with people who travel a lot. Is there also like, the same thing happening to people who aren't of this kind of world traveling creative class and how has that happened how does that play out well i i, I want to say something now that may not answer your question uh but it responds to something that was that was said earlier and and a lot of this conversation it's not just uh magazines like Kinfolk, and it's not just digital platforms like Airbnb that are spreading this aesthetic. I mean, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it was Ikea. It was a, 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 a not even mail order catalog Ikea. It was brick and mortar store Ikea. So uh, maybe the technology changes, the means change, but there are always agents that are disseminating different cultural forms or new cultural forms. Now maybe it's, you know, the scale is, is much greater and it's easier to access these cultural forms as a template. Yeah, I mean, I think to that point, there's, there's a dis distinction between like buying a product from an Ikea, say like the same Ikea table is everywhere, and then assembling like a curated lifestyle assemblage that it like signifies something for you so I think that is the shift that's happened like it's not something you can just buy from one company yet mm -hmm. it's something that you kind of have to assemble and then identify with but I think to to the question something that I wish I had talked about more when I introduced uh, myself I guess is that I do think this effect is is most prevalent within like a, a global mobile like creative class uh, and I think 
I think similar things will happen outside of it, but I think it's important to talk about how exclusive and isolating and uh, dangerous the spread of an aesthetic like that can be. Like I think after I published um, that piece on like the generic coffee shop, someone in South Africa said that whenever they walked into a coffee shop like that, like, you know, it felt like a symbol of, of violent gentrification and oppression. Um, so I think there's like, they're, they're very different, like the same thing can be seen from two very different angles. So uh, I think we're, we're about out of time. I wanna uh, give, uh, please give one more round of applause to our wonderful panel. And uh, uh, stick around, don't go anywhere. We're gonna go right into our, our second keynote. Thank you.